Hello and welcome to Codex Lee. My name is Lee and this is a channel about books. So in 2020 I've decided that I'm going to slightly change the way that I track my reading in that this year I'm going to include magazines that I read. But the magazine I want to talk to you about today concerns something called slow journalism. And if you don't know what slow journalism is, it's basically a way of uh, talking about news events, current events around the world that aren't quite as current. So Delayed Gratification magazine, which I'm going to discuss today, uh, boasts that it is the last to breaking news. So to give you an example of what this means, this year is the latest edition of Delayed Gratification magazine. So this reached me uh, at the end of December, but it covers events that occurred in July, August and September of last year. And the advantage of this is that the journalists who write for delayed gratification can reflect on events, not just the events themselves, but on the consequences of those events. It allows more time and space for reflective, thoughtful analysis, rather than just breaking the news story or providing some knee-jerk analysis. Uh, it goes into really uh, into the depth of an event and its consequences and impact, and I find that really fascinating. So uh, I've been subscribing to Delight Gratification magazine since around mid-2016, which I think is really interesting because that's kind of around the time that the current era that we're in of political mayhem sort of really kicked off because that's when uh, the, the Brexit referendum happened and it was shortly after that that we had the election of Donald Trump and, and all the subsequent chaos in the world. So it's been really interesting to read about all these different significant world events through the prism of slow journalism. And what I want to do today is share with you 10 examples of slow journalism stories from Delayed Gratification magazine, specifically from the 10 editions that I still have in my possession. So I lost the first copy, I think I maybe have lent that to a friend, and I lost uh, issue 28 as well. Um, but for the other ones, so issues 25 to 35, I'm just going to highlight one story from each of these that really resonated with me and I'd love to share with you. If any of these have been published on Delayed Gratification's website, I will link to those down below as well. So first up is issue 25. Um, and this uh, covers events that occurred in October, November and December 2016. Uh, I just want to highlight the, the covers as I go through because there are some really stunning covers. Each of them is by a different artist um, and they interview the artists who designed the covers in each of these editions and they reflect a bit on the cover itself and, and their, their wider work. And it's really fascinating. That's, they're just really gorgeous covers. So the story that I wanted to highlight from this edition um, is all about Gambia. Um, and it's called The Making of a President. I'll just read you the blurb about this. So on the morning, uh, one morning in November 2016, a tiny West African nation woke up to find its autocratic leader of 22 years had been toppled, and in his place was a former security guard for the Holloway Road branch of Argos. Anna Dubuis tells the story of the Gambia's unlikely revolution. So this is all about um, Adama Barrow and how he became president in Gambia. And it talks a lot about um, the previous president, Yaya Jamey, um, and there's a picture of him there. Uh, and it talks about how um, a group that formed around Adama Barrow helped to kind of shape his image and, help, and helped him, helped to sell him essentially to the people of the Gambia to replace their um, brutal autocratic ruler and the reason I found that interesting because it was just a rare hopeful story um, because when Adama Barrow came to power um, he overturned a lot of the really repressive policies of his, of his predecessor. It was really interesting learning about him uh, and how this guy who as the blurb said was a security guard at a department store in London um, came to be the president of Gambia. Okay issue 26 looks like this Another really fascinating cover. And this covers January, February and March of 2017. So the piece that I wanted to highlight from this um, is called Three Years in Crimea. Um, and it looks like that. And here's the blurb. On the 16th of March 2014, Crimeans voted to reintegrate into the Russian Federation. Two days later, Russian flags flew over Crimea. Paul Stafford travelled to the peninsula in 2015 and 2017, assessing the impact of Western sanctions and Putin's charm offensive on its people. And the reason I wanted to highlight this piece was because um, it's really an extended essay um, about Crimea um, following Russian annexation, and it provides you know, really different perspectives on what life is like um, in the Crimean Peninsula 
um, at this point in time. Uh, I guess it, it kind of forced me to reassess many of my assumptions. Um, so there was this this referendum. Um, of course, there are many accusations you can make about how free and fair was that particular referendum, which are you know, legitimate questions to ask. But then there are many people interviewed in this piece who were legitimately happy to be reintegrated into Russia. There was this huge bridge that was built connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. Um, there was just an extraordinary piece of engineering. And obviously, it was very much in Russians' interest to have this this... Uh, to have this connection to Crimea. I was just really fascinated reading about um, these people and how they felt and how some felt very embittered and how some felt pretty okay about um, being now a part of Russia. Issue 27 looks like this, lots of penguins, and this covers April, May and June 2017. And the piece that I wanted to highlight from this edition is called The Great Escape. Um, and as you can see from the picture here, this is all about animals. In April, a band of animal lovers entered the besieged city of Mosul, their mission to save Lulu the bear and Simba the lion, the last two inhabitants of the city's destroyed zoo. They faced ISIS snipers, red tape, and an Iraqi army general who wanted the animals dead. And then they tackled Syria. Marcus Webb tells the story of two incredible rescues. Um, it's a really fascinating story, and the photography is, is kind of heartbreaking. Um, it's a mixture of... Are very sad and very heartwarming. It does kind of have a happy ending, but obviously it's in you know, very distressing circumstances. Um, I just thought it was an excellent piece of journalism. Um, and if that story in particular interests you, then if you haven't already seen it, then I highly recommend watching the Netflix documentary Dogs. Um, episode two is about a dog called Zeus and how his owner tries to um, get him out of war-torn Syria. Um, it's probably the best episode of that show, although all of them are worth watching. Okay, on to issue 29, which looks like that. It's very wavy. Uh, and this covers October, November, and December 2017. And the piece I wanted to highlight is called The Battle of Bitcoin. Here's the blurb. On the 17th of December, Bitcoin hit a historic high of $19,193.72. But it wasn't always such a financial powerhouse. Brian Patrick Eha tells the story of the day the cryptocurrency almost died and of the ex-con who saved it. So this is all about a guy called Rod Zervais, um, and he's a kind of a bit of a nobody, but he takes an interest in Bitcoin, um, and this kind of traces his journey, um, but it also teaches you a lot about Bitcoin that I didn't know before, um, and it has a little Bitcoin explainer that just tells you a bit about how it, it, it all works, uh, and then just sort of tracing the value of Bitcoin. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting combination of this kind of human story about this 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 guy um, but also it's very factual and I learned a lot about Bitcoin just reading this piece. Moving on to issue 30, it's very colourful, uh, and this covers January, February and March 2018. And the piece that really stuck out to me um, is this one, which is called It's Been a Bit of a Shock for Salisbury. So this is all about the Salisbury um, poisonings in the UK. And the blurb says, on Sunday the 4th of March, a former, former spy, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter, Yulia, were found poisoned on a bench in the centre of Salisbury. Rob Orchard traces the fallout from a global diplomatic incident in a quiet city in Wiltshire. And I thought this was such a well-written piece that really does uh, give you a feel for what it was like to live in Salisbury, not just when this incident occurred, but in the subsequent weeks and months, what it was like to live there. Um, the kind of reputational hit that, this, that, the, that the city took and how they tried to move on from this. And a really interesting character who jumps out, and you can just about see him there in that picture, uh, is the Reverend Calvin Inglis, the vicar of St. Thomas's Church in Salisbury, who brings a very kind of positive energy. And um, there's a picture, picture here of him um, where he, um, he leads a service cleansing Salisbury um, and he's just trying to bring, I guess, a sense of, of joy back to the place and trying to help the community to move on. Uh, and I just enjoyed it because it just gave me a different, more kind of local perspective on what was really a global event, an event that had global significance. OK, issue 31, which looks like that. Uh, and this covers events in April, May and June 2018. Uh, and the piece that really stuck out to me was called The Fast and the Curious. Um, how do you spot a champion? As Justify wins the Kentucky Derby on the way to claiming the Triple Crown, Seth Stevens Devoudowitz tells the story of how American Faro, the previous horse to achieve the historic hat-trick of American racing, was on the verge of being discarded. 
but then a data nerd spotted its left ventricle. Um, I'm a bit of a data nerd. I'm a data analyst by profession. So I'm interested in data, but I have no interest in no, but I have no interest in horse racing. But this was such a fascinating piece. Um, reading this about this guy um, and his team and how they were analysing different uh, data points about horses to identify horses that didn't appear to be particularly strong runners, but but actually were. So it's kind of like the money ball of horse racing. It's a really interesting read and it's just an example of something that I had no real interest in prior to reading this article uh, and I probably won't have any interest in in the future but they just present the story uh, in such a compelling way. I just I loved it. Okay on to issue 32 which looks like this and this covers events in July, August and September 2018. I think there are a few different stories in this edition that I could have chosen but I, I couldn't really ignore this one. Um, it's called The Great Escape um, and it's all about the, the rescue of the boys trapped in the cave in Thailand. Uh, the blurb says, On the 2nd of July 2018, 12 members of the Wild Boars football team and their coach, Ekapol Ek John Tawong, were found alive deep inside a cave complex in northern Thailand where they had been trapped for over a week after a flash flood. The news was initially greeted with joy, but bringing the boys aged between 11 and 16 out alive would be a huge challenge. This is the story of an extraordinary rescue mission. Um, I learned so many details about the rescue in this piece that I hadn't really picked up in the news coverage, and there was very extensive news coverage at the time, um, which was fascinating. But also the whole thing is is illustrated. Um, it's it almost kind of plays out like a, a comic. And you see, you've got all these pins. Um, it's it's a you know really gorgeous thing to look at, and was just really fascinating. Um, and then in the final sections, it kind of talks a bit about like what these kids were doing, um, were, I guess, expected to do afterwards. Um, like on the 6th of September, the boys appear at a mall in Thailand where they crawl through a replica of the cave, which I didn't know. Um, so yeah, again, this is the benefit of this magazine is that you can read a bit about the aftermath, but it, it integrates it within this wider piece about the rescue itself. It's just a brilliant piece. Issue 33 looks like this and this covers events from October, November and December of 2018. Uh, and the piece that really stuck with me um, is this one. So that's called Horns of a Dilemma and the blurb reads, is the best way to save the rhino to lift the ban on trading its horn? Advocates argue that rhino farming in which the animals are reared before their horns are harmlessly removed and sold would price porches out of the game. As a Christmas Eve deadline to legalise the practice loomed, Harriet Salem met the driving forces behind an industry which could bring its participants unimaginable wealth or financial ruin. Like the piece on Crimea, this kind of forced me to reassess my assumptions about this. So if somebody says, mm, is it a good idea to sell rhino horns, then your immediate reaction is going to be, no, that's a terrible idea. Uh, and I still don't know how I feel about it. I'm probably on balance against it because there is just that natural emotional aversion to the idea of this. But um, the piece argues that it does more harm to not sell these things legally by harmless, harmlessly removing them from rhinos than it does to, to, keep, to keep the ban in place. And then the rhinos are simply killed for these horns. Uh, it is, as the, as the title implies, a real dilemma um, it's a really fascinating piece that explores this issue by talking to the people for and against. And even after about a year since reading this, this, this piece still stays with me uh, quite a lot. Okay, just two more to go. Um, this is issue 34, which is a lovely cover image. Uh, and this covers events from January, February and March of 2019. This was another edition where there were like three or four different stories that I just thought were fantastic and I really struggled to choose one. But again, I went with the one that I thought is the one piece I remember the most about. It would be this one. So it's called A Law Unto Herself. And I'll read the blurb. Kimberly Motley is the only practicing foreign defense lawyer in Afghanistan. As landmark peace talks begin between the Taliban and senior Afghan politicians and regional leaders, brokered by the Kremlin and hosted in Moscow, she tells Marcus Webb about defending justice and what is still a country worth fighting for. So this woman is remarkable. Um, 
there are, she has gained the respect of very many people in Afghanistan, very many Afghans, including some tribal elders, for the work that she has done. So in 2000, so I'll just read a little piece from this because it's fascinating. In 2008, she was a former beauty pageant winner turned lawyer, working in the public defender's office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The pay wasn't great and Motley found herself approaching 30 with student loans to pay off and a young family to support. So when the offer came in to join a Department of Justice funded program to train defense attorneys in Afghanistan, she took it. Um, so this talks about how she moved to Afghanistan and she realized that the way that um, Afghans were being taught was, was really poor and she changed the approach to, uh, to training, to legal training in the country. And then she became involved in many high profile cases. Um, she's a really inspirational woman who I'd never heard of before reading this piece. And finally, issue 35, which looks like this, which is probably my favourite cover, if you can see what's reflected in this woman's glasses. I love this cover. Uh, and this covers events from April, May and June of 2019. Now, again, there were several pieces I loved in this particular issue, um, but I think the one that, that stuck with me most would be The Lost Stand of the Gurkhas. Um, so if you're not aware of who the Gurkhas are, then this is a great piece to read, to learn about them. I was aware of who they are because um, they were in the news quite a lot in the UK. Uh, I'll read you the blurb. Ten years ago, former, former Gurkha soldiers won the right to settle in the UK. It was an unlikely victory for a shoestring campaign spearheaded by a man with little political experience and an actor best known for playing a drunk. So how did it win against the massed forces of an intransigent government? Rob Orchard tells the story of a fight whose consequences are still playing out today. Uh, I love this piece because it provides a bit of a retrospective on something that happened, you know, a decade ago, um, and then looks at the consequences of allowing Gurkha soldiers the right to settle in the UK. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's a very balanced piece because it looks at some of the difficulties they've faced in, in living here and how this decision impacted on, on other people. Uh, and it retells the story that I'd, I'd seen in the news at the time um, in a way that provides details that I, I wasn't aware of. I didn't know the guy who actually got the whole thing going. I, I knew that Joanna Lumley was involved, um, who you may know from Absolutely Fabulous. A zeppelin in a condom, darling. <laughs> Um, but I, I didn't know the people behind the scenes, so it, it really gave me a, a different perspective on the story. And I love learning about the veterans living in Aldershot. So a lot of them moved to Aldershot, which has housed the Royal Gurkha Rifles since 1987. So many of them had existing ties there. And I love the little details like how um, the Gurkha veterans had free bus passes. So they would just ride the buses around Aldershot all day. And that was really annoying the locals. So they had to kind of talk to them and come to some compromise about how often they could ride on these buses. Uh, it's a really moving, really fascinating piece. Uh, and a really nice way to end this video, really. Um, that, I think, just gives you a bit of an insight into what slow journalism is. Fire, I think, a really superb publication. Um, I really recommend subscribing to Delayed Gratification. I think it's a healthy way of consuming the news. I don't only get my news through reading about it retrospectively months later. I do look at the Guardian website and the Times website, so I get a centre-left and a centre-right perspective on the news. Uh, and obviously things pop up on my Twitter and my Facebook and whatever as well. But that kind of news consumption is always so urgent and so fraught and is sometimes revised later. Um, not in the sense, I don't mean that in the sense that it is necessarily wrong, although sometimes it can be, but more in the sense that something that seems a crisis at the time turns out to be not so much of a crisis. Uh, and sometimes something that seems to affect one group of people actually affects another group of people even more who were overlooked in the, in the initial coverage. I don't think I'm ever going to break the habit of trying to keep up with breaking news, but I feel as though it is a healthy counterpoint to then read about these breaking news stories later in a calmer fashion. So this, is, so this video was a little bit off topic today, but I hope that you enjoyed it. If so, then give me a like and please subscribe to my channel. Um, and I promise that normal content about books will resume shortly. So I'll see you guys soon.